call her Dr. Donna Battle now because she finished her PhD in marriage and family therapy, which is amazing. Um, and she always gives us uh, such a thoughtful word and reflection on scripture. So would you please put your hands together for Pastor Donna. I give God thanks and praise for being in this space and for literally the way my spirit leaps for joy when I'm at the way. Amen. It's like it's leaping inside of me. It's like I want to go a million ways at once and all the only thing that's holding me together is my skin. Amen. And so I give God thanks and praise for that. That is a deep joy, particularly in these strange times where there is so much to lament to be able to celebrate is a gift. So God is good to me and God is good all the time. And so I give God thanks and praise always for my partner in life, for my husband who is um, home with the babies. And I give God thanks and praise for his love. Amen. And for equal partnership and for what that means. Um, I told the nine o'clock service that, you know, you extend some grace to a sister. I know you're in the midst of a series um, called The Ties That Bind. And so this is also the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And since I'm not preaching a Thanksgiving ser sermon, it might be good for you to just pause for a moment and just give God thanks for something. You know, that'll be your sermon on gratitude. Amen. <laughs> the last precursor I will give before we read this scripture is that for those of you who don't know me, I want you to know that the amount of scripture I read is not an indication of how long the sermon will be. And so do not in any way get nervous or think we're about to be in church all day. <laughs> Because I, too, want to eat some chicken when I leave about a year, all right? I want some food. But we are going to look at two passages of Scripture. The first that I will be reading is from Acts 3, and it is the core text for our sermon today. But the second passage in Matthew that we will be reading, um, I read in your hearing because it is mentioned enough throughout the sermon that we need reference to it. And so I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It should be before you on the screen, and it reads as follows. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. And Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. Matthew 26, starting at verse 36, reads as follows. Then Jesus went with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to him, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. When he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men stay watch, keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. 
Watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he went away in a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Let's pray. God, because your word never fails us, we pray in this moment that you bring us in from the places that our minds have traveled to, that we may be fully present in this space. God, we pray that as you rise up and as you speak, that you will make our ears keen to the sound of your voice, that we might love and allow ourselves to be loved, that we might say yes to you and not no, that we may lean in and not create distance. Give us what we need in this space, for we are your people, the sheep of your pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about loneliness. And I can remember being in fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh grade for four years, literally. Being in school and, and literally hating to go to school every day. So it was one of those things where I had a few classmates who just were really, really focused on making my life miserable. <laughs> And so they would find new ways to isolate and to ostracize me, and this went on, and this went on. And I didn't always know where I should even sit for lunch, because on any given day it seemed like I was welcome, but then I would sit down, and for 30 minutes I would be belittled in very subtle and sometimes overt ways. I would hold my tears in and cry when I got home, only even telling my parents a couple of times or here or there because in some crazy way I felt like I was gonna be a burden if I told them. But there's one specific memory that I have that sticks out for me, and that was at the end of my fifth grade year. I was 10 years old and my teacher overheard two classmates making fun of me. She scolded them and then she grabbed me and she says, I want you to stay back for a minute. Let me walk with you to the bus. And so as we walked, she asked me, she says, well, how long has this been going on? I said, all year. And all of a sudden she lit into me. It was like she slapped me in my face. She was like, what? She's like, you've been going through this all year and you didn't tell me? She's like, you should have known better than that. She says, I'm disappointed in you. And in that moment, I felt very deeply as if she didn't care really about what I was experiencing. It was more about how she felt about not knowing. She was in a position to make it better, and she made it worse. And all that skill that I had developed over two years of, you know, holding my tears in just went out the door as my eyes began to sting and burn. Tears just welled up and came uncontrollably. And then I had to get on the bus with my peers in tears, the one thing I did not want to do, right? And I can remember that being a very clear memory of what I can best describe as like this complex loneliness, this space in which, you know, I really, really wanted other people to be with me in it, but I didn't want anybody really close to me. I didn't want people asking me questions. I didn't want people probing. Like, I wanted to be distant, but I wanted people to be close. And I've had many, many other experiences of loneliness over the course of my life, and I can only imagine what it's like for people who experience this every day. And I've been present with enough people to know that that is some people's real existence daily. But one of my favorite poets, Lucille Clifton, has one of my favorite quotes of all time. And she says this, she says, come celebrate with me. For every day, something has tried to kill me and has failed. 
Literally in 15 words, you all, she is able to hold her entire experience, an experience she did not choose but must live with. She names pain and power and resilience. And even though it is hers to process, it is her experience to live through, she still chooses to invite other people to be with her in it, even though they can't carry it for her. There are cultures, there are environments, there are personalities, there are realities, capabilities, families that we are often born into that shape us and mold us in any number of ways that we have no control over. This man was lame from birth. He could not walk at birth. And yet he was dependent based upon reality on others to get him to where he needed to be. It was very common in this society for people to see a person like him and really think that it was either him or his parents, the sin of him or his parents that caused him to be this way. We see this showing up in the gospel according to John chapter 9 when the disciples say to Jesus as he is about to um, heal a blind man, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is blind? Any time someone is blamed for their condition, there is no compassion. And where there is no compassion, there can be no effort to understand or even see the real experiences of a person. This man literally was brought by people every day by the gate called Beautiful at the entrance of a temple so that he could ask for money at a time when people's hearts were most vulnerable in an effort to get some compassion. They're more likely to say yes while they enter the temple. And so John, the son of Zebedee, and Peter are walking up the hill. They enter the gate and are preparing to enter the temple for three o'clock worship as they often did every day. And this man speaks to them, asking them for money. The very first thing they say to him after they look intently at him, is look at us. He raises his eyes to look them in the face, and Peter says to him, I don't have any money, but what I have, I give to you. There is great peace in offering what we have rather than dwelling and regretting what we don't. And so he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Stand up and walk. He reaches his hand down. He pulls him up. And it says that immediately the muscles in his, his feet and his ankles are strengthened to the point that he is able to jump. Now, I told 9 a.m. that I would really like to preach this part of the sermon. Like, I want to preach it, but since I can't preach it, I think it's worth naming. Like, that's a sermon in and of itself. This idea that life brings to us because of where we are situated in society the experience of some muscles being overworked while other muscles are underworked, right? This idea that depending on where we are sitting in society, we might have muscles that have atrophied, muscles that are so weak that they can't be used, like financial muscles, like I need help muscles, like I feel secure muscles. And for those who live in a more favorable light of society, humility muscles and resilience muscles. <laughs> but all of the muscles when atrophied have the capacity to maim us. This man jumps, he walks, and then he enters with them into the temple leaping and praising God. And all the people see him. They see him and they are in awe. They are astonished that this man is the man who used to sit by the gate, has now been healed. And it says that while he still clings to Peter and John, they run towards them on the portico. The people are now focused on Peter and John and this man. They have the people's attention. Now, y'all, I tried about five times to not preach this passage. 
So anytime I prepare to preach, it is, I mean, even after two decades, over 20 years of preaching, I mean, literally, it is a grueling process for me. Like, it doesn't get easier. And that's okay. I might get scared if it gets too easy, right? But literally this time, I would read this passage and I'd put it down. I'm like, nope, I'm not preaching that. Five times, and every time when I picked it back up, it was because it came up in a conversation or it came up in a book or an article I was reading or it popped up on TV somehow. Like every time this passage around the gate called beautiful kept popping up to the extent that I had to admit that perhaps that was God. <laughs> perhaps. It's like I couldn't ignore it anymore. And then after I settled myself on preaching this passage, I said, okay, well, which direction do I go in? I mean, I've already kind of alluded to several ways in which I could preach it, several ways I would have preferred to preach it. But no, I have to preach this sermon from the perspective of loneliness, how it shows up in this passage and what it says to us. And the first thing I think that we must highlight in this passage is that no one was with this man. No one was with this man. The very first thing that Peter and John do is they look intently at this man. They don't heal him first. They don't heal his physical body first. Their first action is to connect and acknowledge his humanity. They look intently at him. And then what is the first thing they say? Look at us. And I had to ask the question, how is it that this man is coming day after day to this gate to ask people for money and he's not even looking at them? He's asking people, but they aren't having to draw their attention to him at all. What in the world is going on and why is it important for us to know that they looked intently at him? So my husband, who has um, worked most of his adult life in some capacity with um, brothers and sisters who are experiencing homelessness, reminded me once of the experience of people who go for long periods of time without others looking them in the face or in the eyes. Long periods of time without speaking to them. And there are some brothers and sisters who have um, shared out of this experience that you know, once you go so long around so many people who do not see you or who do not look at you or who ignore you, go so long without having another conversation with another human being, you begin to talk to yourself as a means of survival. And what this means is that some of the brothers and sisters who are on the street who are talking to themselves are not losing their mind but trying to keep it. This man was not seen. Right? This interaction points to the fact that there is a lonely existence. He's not just alone, but there is a sadness that is existing in this. That not only did people not see him, but he had responded behaviorally to their decision not to see him. He adjusted the way he behaved. He decided, okay, it makes you uncomfortable if I look at you, so guess what? I'm not going to look at you. He gave them an out. Don't see me. And it's had to make it harder to raise or to, you know, collect money because, I mean, it's a whole lot harder to say no to somebody. Miss Sharon, can I get some money? <laughs> I mean, if you want to give me something, you really can. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> it's a lot harder to say no to someone when you're staring them in the face. Yeah. Right? But he was constantly giving people an out. He was saying, you don't have to look at me. And when we realize that loneliness is existing, how do we see this existing? Because it says that people brought him daily. People, right? Not the friend-like people who lifted a roof off of a whole house in Luke to drop a brother down so that Jesus could heal him, right? Not a parent like Jarius who petitions Jesus for his daughter's healing while she's on her deathbed. Not the centurion man who comes to Jesus very humbly because he wants his servant healed. There is no sign of relationship whatsoever, just people. Bring this man and sit him by the gate. 
They had enough pity for him to bring him, but they couldn't see him enough to be with him. There was a movie that came out in 1996 called Jerry Maguire. Y'all remember Jerry Maguire? Some of y'all will remember Jerry Maguire. <laughs> Thank you. Age is a beast. <laughs> Creeps up on you. You start referencing stuff and people be like, crickets? <laughs> That's how you know your generation is moving on, right? <laughs> but I digress, y'all. Don't distract me. Don't distract me. So Jerry Maguire, 1996 movie, is about a man who is a sports agent and he is working for this big firm and he has this epiphany, right? that he wants to care for his clients in a different way. And so he writes this beautiful speech. He walks up in that firm the next day, and you know, he is just going on this emotional speech about what we should do, how we should do it, how he's going to quit. And then he quits, and at the end he says, now who's with me? And it's just like this, awkward silence. Finally, one woman. Dorothy, played by Renee Zellweger, Wagger, Wigger, Wagger, Renee, Renee. She says, I am, I'm with you, right? Nobody else joins with him, but the power of I'm with you in that moment solidifies their bond so much that this dude, he marries her. Now, I'm not saying that when somebody admit that they with you, don't, I'm not saying. <laughs> That's not the sign. I feel, like, I feel like I need to get that precursor. That ain't the sign. I'm just saying that's what he did. He clung to that sister. He clung to her. And what we see is that this man is very lonely. And it's not just him that is lonely, but we see that our Savior Jesus also experienced loneliness. If we look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane, you all, he is literally in emotional pain. He is in a hard, dark, deep place. Jesus takes his three closest, two of whom show up in our first passage, Peter and John, the son of Zebedee. Two of them were taken with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. He sits them here. He goes deeper in the garden to pray. He asks them to stay awake with him, to keep vigil, to pray with him, right? And we literally see Jesus step through the five stages of grief. If there's any way for him to be free of this, denial. If there's any way for this cup to be taken from him, bargaining. He's deeply agitated and distressed, depression. He comes back to see the brothers who he think got his back, sleep, anger. <laughs> anger, I be angry too. Keep your butt away. And then he goes back to the garden, laying on his face, you all, he is prostrate, his face is to the ground, praying and struggling alone. He is lonely until finally he reaches resolve acceptance. And he says, if there's no way for this to be taken from me, so be it. Your will be done. Your will be done. And so he reaches this sense of peace in this garden only to go the next day to the cross and experience loneliness all over again. What does he say on the crucifix? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you abandoned me? And this takes us to the second thing we must name in this passage. Being free from loneliness on one day does not mean we won't also have to be free tomorrow. That you can't just have one experience of freeing and think that you won't have to have multiple experiences of doing this. So if we go back to this passage with um, the brother from the gate called Beautiful, it seems like people see him after he's healed, right? They're in awe, they're astonished, but in truth, his social, social situation really hasn't shifted all that much. I would argue that they noticed him when he was lame, meaning polite attention, enough to take pity, right? And I would also argue that they only noticed him after he was healed. They didn't really see him. 
They just noticed that something was different. They were in awe over what had happened, but they still could not see that brother. They were flocking to him and to Peter and John almost like it was a circus. It's like voyeurism. Let me come view what I don't understand and can't see. Now, I'm not saying that God don't work up in that, but we're looking at this from this brother's point of view today. Right? His healing of his body did not change the potential for his loneliness to stay. It didn't shift it. And so we see a man named Harry Nowen, who was a theologian, did deep work around pastoral care and justice. He says this, all human beings are alone. No other person will completely feel like we do, think like we do, act like we do. Each of us is unique and our aloneness is the other side of our uniqueness. The question is whether or not we let our aloneness become loneliness or whether we allow it to lead us into solitude. Loneliness is painful. Solitude is peaceful. Loneliness makes us cling to others in desperation. Solitude allows us to respect others in their uniqueness and create community. Letting our aloneness grow into solitude and not into loneliness is a lifelong struggle. It requires conscious choices about whom to be with, what to study, how to pray, and when we ask for counsel. But wise choices will help us to find the solitude where our hearts can grow in love. We've got to climb this mountain more than once before we just proclaim all victory. It's not just once. And he is petitioning literally to say that as we are alone, there are two paths we can take. We can take the path to loneliness or we can take the path to solitude. Solitude is literally a spiritual discipline. It is a spiritual practice of the church. Another theologian, Quaker theologian, Richard Foster, says this about solitude. He says, solitude is where we actually learn how to be our true self, because it is in solitude that we are free from other people's expectations of us. Have you ever had a season in your life where you know you've got to do something alone? It might come most poignantly when you realize that somebody you love has to do something alone. In 2012, my father had what appeared to be a very brief illness before his death. And I can remember the last time I saw my daddy, I went home, he was home in hospice care. And I wanted to make him laugh because my daddy was a, a jolly old soul. Literally, jovial, extrovert, happy, telling jokes all the time. But he was weak and quiet. He had stopped eating and had lost a tremendous amount of weight. I wanted to eat for him, but I couldn't. I wanted to walk for him in his weakness, but I couldn't. Now, he and I had a running joke. They said, we wish God would create a way for those of us who wanted to release weight like me we could give it to our brothers and sisters who wanted to gain weight. That sounds a lot like justice, don't it? <laughs> Y'all might want to pray for that next time. <laughs> Lord, make a way for us to balance this thing out. It's justice. Let's heal each other. And I can remember being there and remembering us having conversations about that and laughing about that. But in that moment, I couldn't bring it out of my mouth because it was so real. I literally wanted to give weight to my daddy. And I couldn't. The night before he died, my mama says that he asked her to lay down in the bed with him and to rub his head. And then he asked her to pray. And after they prayed, he said to her, he said, baby, God is with me. He says, and I'm ready to go home. I'm tired. That moment was the closest any of us could get to being with him in what he was experiencing. At that moment forward, it was him and God alone. 
Jesus was in that garden of Gethsemane, and he was lonely, but his prayers to God led him to a place of solitude, a place of peace, where he recognized what? I have got to do this, and it's got to be done by me alone. What did he say to his disciples? Where I go, you cannot follow. Now, I need to give another precursor. This is not a call to isolation. That is not what this is. Jesus brought his boys to the, to the garden. They knew what was going on with him, right? They couldn't stay away, but they were there. <laughs> and this man by the gate, he too needed people to get him where he needed to go. Now, how they helped needed a little redemption, but people were still there. This is not a call to isolation. This is how we um, start to understand like the paradox of things, how we exist within dichotomies, two seemingly contradictory places. This is understanding that I am me and you are you. It means that I may be impacted by what you're going through, but what I feel is what I feel, just like what you feel is what you feel. I can't feel for you and you can't feel for me, but we can be with one another as we go through our own processes. It is being alone and autonomous while simultaneously needing to be in community to survive. It's not either or, it's both and. And that takes us to our final piece. And that is when loneliness rises, we are called to enter in. We are called to enter in. Jesus is very honest in this garden. He doesn't hold back from God the Father. He doesn't, you know, just say, Lord, your will be done or help me accept your will. He say, no, I really want you to take this doggone thing from me. Right? He's very honest. He doesn't shuck and jive. And he keeps coming back. He keeps coming back in a very raw, real, open, vulnerable way. And even when he goes to the cross, let's go back to what he says. He doesn't say to his mama Mary, why has God abandoned me? He doesn't say to his brother James, why has God abandoned me? He is on that cross and he speaks directly to God. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He is still praying. The assumption is that even though I cannot feel you and I feel abandoned by you, I'm going to be honest about that, but I am not assuming that you can't hear me. No, I know you hear me. That's why I'm still talking to you. Right? This raw honesty. Now, when we go back to our passage at the gate called Beautiful, this brother is healed, he jumps, he walks, and then he enters into the temple with Peter and John. There's two very stark differences between these two accounts in this way, right? Jesus enters into his sacred space with God while he's in pain. This man does not enter into sacred space until after his pain is lifted. We see now these two varying paths we can take, one leading to loneliness and one leading to solitude. If we have to wait for our pain to be lifted before we enter a sacred space, we will constantly be living in loneliness. And we know this brother is still struggling with loneliness. How? Because Henry now says this, he says what? When you are lonely, you cling in desperation. If we look at verse 11, it says what? He clung to Peter and John, wanting them to continue to alleviate his sadness and his agitation. He was clinging to the only people who in maybe his entire life had seen him. And yet even they needed to go on about their business. And if we look at chapter 4, y'all, this brother actually he, he actually followed him to, to prison. They, he, they arrested them, and he's still in the background lingering. People still, still point out, this brother over here got healed, and they arrested. He is still following them. That there is in this loneliness, when loneliness rises up, 
that that is literally a marker. It should be a warning to us to move into intimacy. Enter does not just mean to come in. It means to penetrate. It is a deeply intimate word. It means to be fully engulfed in your whole person by another. Physical example. We all came into this sanctuary, the building, today, right? You came in here, but you couldn't leave part of your body outside. Your whole body had to walk in here and sit down, which means that unconsciously, probably, because we don't be thinking about this, right? Unconsciously, when you sat down in this space, you were agreeing to be encapsulated by these walls, fully. My, 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 yes, baby. <laughs> I love it. And yet, when it comes to our mind and our spirit and our emotions, we resist being fully engulfed by God. I'm telling you, we do. Scripture tells us we do. So just because we can't name where that place is doesn't mean it's not there. At the fall, we are told that humanity did not want to be fully dependent upon God. And so we saw what? Independence. That we are constantly struggling to have control and power over what we cannot control. And so whatever that thing is that we want control over that we can't control, we are not allowing God into that space with us. And yet, Foster says that what solitude leads us to who we truly are. And who are we? We are created in the image of a triune God. What does that mean? It means that we believe that God is one God, three persons, communing intimately. We use this word called perichoresis, which means an interpenetrating, that there is this very intimate existence between Father, Son, and Spirit that make them one. It is interpenetrating. It is very intimate. That means that the very essence of our identity is woven with intimacy. We enter in. We enter into the temple. And notice, Jesus doesn't go to a church. Jesus doesn't go to an edifice called the temple. Jesus goes where? To the garden. Why? Because our bodies are the temple of the Lord. And who is the church, the people in this room? We are the body of Christ. That means that whether we are entering individually or whether we are in, entering communally, it is a call to be with God in a very intimate, engulfing way. That means that when I come into this place in my honesty, my anger is worship. It means that when I come into this place honesty, my pain is worship. It means my doubt is worship. It means that whatever I honestly lay before my God on the altar is worship because all I can give is what I got. And I'm going to spend time giving what I got rather than feeling guilty for what I don't. This brother by the gate called Beautiful did not fully understand in whose name he was being healed in. He did not fully understand that the Jesus Christ of Nazareth also had another name called Emmanuel which literally means God is with us. He did not understand that Jesus was fully human and fully divine, that God chose to penetrate our human experience, to be in it with us, to experience it, to know it, so that we would not be alone in it. He did not realize that Jesus of Nazareth was born in a very unconventional way to a brown-skinned Jewish teenage unmarried mama on the floor of a barn called the ground. <laughs> he didn't understand that Jesus was a refugee as a toddler because there was a spineless king so insecure that he was threatened by a baby boy. He didn't understand that he was called to healing in the name of a man who was literally put on trial not for what he did but for who he was. That he was betrayed by
by the people closest to him. And that the one he felt would be the ride or die, he even in the end felt abandoned by God. He didn't understand that this was a Jesus who entered in with him. Our loneliness is a call to salvation. It is a call to intimacy. It is a call to God. It is a call to live into the image of this deeply intimate, engulfing God. It is a call that when hope is fading out and we feel like we have literally been body slammed to the ground with a boot on our throat, it is a call that when we look up and to the face of whatever is holding us down, we can proclaim with those upon whose free labor and mutilation built this country, we can proclaim with the ancestors of Jesus who were Hebrew slaves in Egypt, we can proclaim with those who literally lived day in and day out dodging emotionally chaotic assassins who still in the midst of their pain and their struggle sought to find hope and sought to invite God in. We can proclaim with them. We are pressed on every side but not crushed. We are perplexed. Perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken and we are struck down but not destroyed. We can proclaim with Mother Lucille Clifton, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. We can proclaim that even when we don't feel it, we are not alone because God is with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.